Chesterton, Indiana. January 8, 1933. The body of Chicago's chief Northside racketeer, Ted Newberry, is found in a ditch along a lonely stretch of road. Once when being questioned about a gangland murder, Newberry simply told detectives, he must have done something. They don't kill you for nothing. Newberry was born on Chicago's northwest side on June 28, 1898 and spent most of his adult life in crime. As a young man he had a job as a superintendent for the Checker Cab Company. What his responsibilities were is unknown, but it may have had something to do with sabotaging rival Yellow Cab. During his tenure he became involved with another Chicago hoodlum of renown, Eugene Red McLaughlin, whose brother Robert, became head of the company and a lifelong friend of Newberry's. By 1924 Newberry had moved into booths. He was involved in the shooting of a bootlegger who catered to the elite of Chicago's Gold Coast, but nothing came of it. Later that year, Newberry's criminal career was nearly cut short when he was arrested for murder. By this time, Newberry, his pal Red McLaughlin and a few others had procured Prohibition agent badges and, posing as government agents, were shaking down small-time bootleggers and tavern keepers. One of those they targeted was Omer Finch. In addition to being part owner of a tavern, Finch was also a bootlegger in his hometown of Chicago Ridge, about 12 miles south of Chicago. In early December 1924, the fake agents pulled over Finch and confiscated four barrels of alcohol. They then hustled the bootlegger into their car and tucked him into a hotel in Chicago, demanding a $5,000 ransom for his release. Finch told them that he could only scare up a thousand. Newberry accepted that as a down payment and a meeting was set up where Finch would pay off the balance. Assuming that the gang were actually corrupt government officials, Finch decided that they couldn't prosecute him for the four barrels of alcohol since they already shook him down for the thousand, so he blew off the meeting. Not happy about the turn of events, Newberry, McLaughlin and two others burst into Finch's tavern and, after calling Finch a double-crosser, sprayed the bar with bullets. Finch was hit and died later at the hospital. Ironically it was two other bootleggers who caused the arrest of Newberry. Knowing Finch, they mentioned that they had been pulled over by hijackers who stole their car and booze and demanded $200 for their return. They stated that Finch was in the car and authorities were able to trace the auto back to Newberry. A federal investigator stated that by posing as agents, Newberry's gang had extorted thousands from over 30 saloon keepers. Things didn't look good for Newberry, in addition to having his car and agent's badge, prosecutors also had bellboys from the hotel where they kept Finch who could identify him. They also had Finch's son and two other witnesses who saw the shooting. But this was Prohibition era Chicago. Twice the trial was postponed and Newberry spent the better half of 1925 in jail before finally being released. By the end of the decade Newberry was the big shot on the northwest side of Chicago controlling the bootlegging and gambling. He was considered a strong ally to the North Side Gang, who at the time was headed by George Bugs Moran. In fact, Newberry was with Moran on the morning of February 14, 1929 when the latter was on his way to his gang's garage. As they approached the building they saw a couple of police cars pull up. Assuming there was a raid going on, the two men kept walking. Whom they thought were cops were actually gunmen employed by Al Capone who entered the garage and murdered seven of Moran's gang in what became known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Three months later, Capone was arrested in Philadelphia on a gun charge and sentenced to a year in prison. By the end of 1929, it was Newberry's turn to be on the spot. On the evening of November 30th, two men opened fire on him from a car. He was hit in the wrist. A month or so later, according to the Chicago Tribune, Newberry learned of a machine gun nest that was planted across the street from his headquarters and hightailed it to Canada. His second-in-command, Al Schimberg, fled to Michigan. Left to run things were subordinates Benny Bennett and John Rito, known as the Billiken. Around the 1st of February, 1930, Bennett vanished. About a month later Rito too disappeared, but he didn't stay disappeared for long. 
After spending two weeks underwater, his body broke loose from its constraints and floated to the top of the Chicago River. The day after the Billiken surfaced, Capone was released from the Eastern State Penitentiary and returned home. If indeed it was Capone's mop after Newberry, at some point peace was declared and Capone recognized Newberry as the leader of the North Side. To commemorate, Capone gifted Newberry with a diamond-studded belt buckle, an offering that the big guy often bestowed on his esteemed colleagues. After a few months of quiet, Newberry found himself dragged into one of the most infamous murders of the Prohibition era, when one gun, of a batch purchased by him, was used in the murder of Chicago Tribune reporter Jake Lingle. Though the North Side boss wasn't responsible for the killing, an associate of his, Jack Zuda, was and since Lingle's murder adversely affected every gangster in Chicago, Zuda had to go. When he got his, some witnesses stated that one of the gunmen was Newberry. The accusation was never proved. The beginning of the end for Newberry came when Capone was sent away for good in the spring of 1932. Newberry and Capone's successor, Frank Mitty, did not get along. Reasons given are that, with Capone gone, poor management plus lower earnings due to the depression led to the Capone organization not earning what it once did. The North Side however, which catered to the wealthy, weathered the hard times better and was still making money. Mitty and company began to eye Newberry's fiefdom in the most coveted manner, and started to chip away at his empire. It was also said that the North Sider owed the Capone gang a large sum of money, and to guarantee a return, they inserted a representative to oversee his affairs. The person they sent was former St. Louis gangster and gunman used in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, Gus Winkler. Newberry and Winkler had a good relationship and things were fine for a while. But then other syndicate men followed and soon Newberry felt like he was being squeezed out. His response was to have Mitty bumped off. On December 19, 1932, police raided Mitty's office and one of the officers shot the gang leader a number of times, supposedly in self-defense. It was a sloppy attempt, and Mitty survived. The wounded crime lord figured out straight away who was behind the botched hit and less than three weeks later, Newberry's body was found. Around his waist, the diamond-studded belt buckle given to him by Al Capone. A reminder of the good old days. In lieu of a motive, detectives could simply return to Newberry's own words, he must have done something. They don't kill you for nothing, 